action. Hi, Phil. Welcome to the Rumeke Talks. Great, Constantine. It's good to see you again. Glad we're doing this. It's terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. Absolutely. My pleasure. So to start off, why did you even decide to pursue a career in, <laughs> in writing? show direct- business and everything? Yeah. You yeah. know, I never wanted to do anything else. It, it, it was that clear to me because, um, you know, my parents were involved in entertainment, my grandparents, and uh, it was just kind of in my blood, you know, and uh, my on my mother's side, there was musicians and agents, and on my father's side were actors, and, uh, you know, my grandfather was on Broadway, and... So it was a full house (laughs) growing up of people in the industry or around the industry. And I grew up in Laurel Canyon. So, you know, I was around it all the time. And and, uh, I think it just kind of seeped into me. And, uh, you know, I took an acting class in my senior year in high school and the bug just bit me. And I'd go home and I'd watch TV and there was such great you know, old movies that I'd watch. And uh, I, I got so inspired by the um, films of Preston Sturgis, who was a great writer, director, at the, at, you know, before, you know, I, I certainly, <laughs> you know, he was much, he died long before I was born. But, you know, all those black and white movies that I watched of his, like uh, Miracle of Morgan's Creek and, um you know, the great McGinty and, and um, uh, all those great movies. I get, I, I just love that kind of screwball comedy with, with great characters and, and emotion. And at, even at such a young age, I got, I just loved it. And the, and the Marx Brothers were another big thing for me. And, um, you know, just, just uh, the Marx Brothers films. I, I love the comedy. And I think I just... I just kind of decided that that was my career and I wasn't going to stop until I did, whether I was going to act or write or whatever. I just wanted to be in the, in the business. So I, I was so focused that I never stopped uh, wanting that, you know. Can you imagine yourself uh, being at that time and uh, the room that you were in, uh, the TV set that you were using to watch all those shows? Uh, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about it. Well, I mean, it was, it was, you know, color had just come around and, and uh, uh, it was like, you know, we used to watch black and white all the time. But, you know, I had a half brother that, that was eventually taught film up in uh, San Francisco, San Francisco State. And he, he was much older than my brother and I. So he would bring over films, you know, with the big reels and, and show them on, on sheets. So it was more like a communal experience of watching the television. Every, yeah, was, everyone gathers. Was, mm-hmm. Everyone gathers. Grandmother come in. You know, it was uh, uh, you know we never we had dinner. Of course, you know we couldn't watch TV while we were eating dinner. But uh, you know that was too much. That was uh, way too uh, <laughs> too crazy. Uh, but eventually, you know, there was TV trays. You know, we get. You know, as I grew up, we got TV trays. So, hey, that was special. Well, we got to eat on a TV tray and watch. Uh, watch. But, but yeah, I, it was always so inspiring for me to, to watch television and movies. Movies were, were huge. You know, every, every Saturday I'd go to the movies. And, mm-hmm. You know, double feature with a cartoon and a, and a newsreel. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, again, great experience. It was a great, it was a, it was, it was a great, um, you know, event. The road shows were were very big. Uh, you know, the big movie theaters like the Egyptian here and the and uh, you know the Pantages was a great movie house. Eventually, the Cinerama Dome and all that. But that was you know we dress up to go to the movies. It was like you know crazy. <laughs> it was like it was it was an event. It was a huge event. And I'd always remember you know you'd buy the souvenir program for a dollar. Uh, and you'd have the program, and there was an intermission in the movie. They'd run three and a half to four hours, you know, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai and Ben Hur and all those fantastic movies, Spartacus. And, you know, they were so long, you'd, you'd have an intermission. 
you'd go out and spend 10, 15 minutes getting a Coke or whatever and come back. Eh? So again, events, they were, it was a big, huge event to see something of entertainment. What was it like to watch Spartacus? Where did you watch it for the first time? At the Pantages Theater. At the Pant- it opened at the P- Pantages. If you go to the Pantages now, it's exactly the same, you know, the big staircase. It was like, you know, my God, I, I'm in a movie theater. <laughs> now, you know, we take it, you know, it's the AMC or, you know, whatever. And there's like seven screens. and But those were like the big events. And I remember the like the first, uh, uh, like the Cinerama, they used to shoot it with three cameras. And then they project it on the screen with three projectors. So you see like a seam in the in the middle of these movies but we didn't care and i still have all those souvenir programs i saved them all they're probably not even worth more than a dollar but uh, they're special to me <laughs> well who knows right now these days you can collect everything <laughs> oh i know i know i i know and i i was a collector i collected so many things comic books and movie posters and all that i still have them all and now oh son, that's great yeah yeah I mean, it is it is amazing my son and i are going through them all now uh and it, it, it's fantastic it really is to see all these things and and a lot of them you know eventually you know i would work with a lot of the actors later on in life like vincent price and all that and he would sign the posters to me that i had bought before i even met him so it's terrific it's terrific oh that that's amazing uh, look at you <laughs> the collector know, as well as the <laughs> yeah, yeah. creator yeah. Yeah. Were, were you registering them through like special services or you were just collecting them i was just collecting yourself? them for myself mm-hmm. but now i'm sending them all off to get certified and all that mm-hmm. you know, certain, certain comic books and all that i'm sending off to get graded and, you know it's like yeah. because i'd always buy one copy to read and one copy to, to save to collect mm-hmm. you know so i wouldn't hardly ever touch those you know those are the ones that went in the mylar envelopes and put away for for like today going through them and you know seeing what i'm going to do with them that's uh yeah because i also co- started collecting coins and i <laughs> uh-huh. entering the world of collectors and how do you do everything and stuff copies yeah yeah it's very it's very oh, interesting. yeah yeah i mean i would prowl hollywood to bookstores and little you know i'd find <laughs> oh there's a Famous Monsters of Filmland, number four. I have to have that. <laughs> so do you remember uh, the first sort of writing that you did that got screened or got produced that yes. you saw on the screen or TV? Uh, actually, the very first thing that I did that I got paid for uh, and that really kind of jump-started my career was a play. I was, I was at... City College here, we were, you know, I had done a bunch of plays and uh, American College Theater Festival, and we had gone back to Washington, D.C. We performed at Ford's Theater, where Lincoln was shot, and, uh, you know, we performed at the Pasadena Playhouse, and so it was a great uh, theater school, and I was, you know, I was going out on auditions, and I was doing stuff here and there, and I'd do, you know, small part in a film or, you know, go out for commercials and uh, stuff. And uh, we had an acting company that kind of came out of the, you know, we all stayed together as, as actors and we were doing um, Christmas Carol during the holiday season. And uh, I was playing uh, the nephew and, uh, and uh, a uh, kind of a comedy show that I had written. We'd do that during the day and then we'd do this uh, Christmas Carol at night. Somebody came to us backstage and said, do you guys want to write your own play and come? We have a theater in L.A. and we, we love you guys. You guys are great. And you've got great energy and all that. And we'll put it up. So everybody wanted to do it, of course. And little by little, everybody kind of dropped out of the writing end of it. You know, everybody was gung ho at first, but little by little, everybody just kind of. And it was, you know, it was a time when, you know, there was a lot of drugs stuff going on and we were living in San Francisco so it was a little nuts but I think I could hold my stuff better than anybody else maybe my psychedelics at the time uh, <laughs> and I I was like the last man standing that that 
that said, I'm going to write this and finish it. And I wrote it and uh, eventually I directed it and it was successful and it ran for uh, quite a while. And uh, then they asked us to write a second one. So I started writing the second one and uh, that really, you know, got me into writing. And, you know, I kind of made the move from from uh, acting to, to writing because I really, I people in the audience were applauding and laughing and I was going, hey, I'm, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm pretty good at this. So that got me going. Yeah. And uh, from there, I, 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 I was also, you know, I wasn't making that, you know, playwrights, <laughs> not making a lot of money there. So I still had to survive and I was getting, you know, small acting things, but nothing big. So I was, I got a job on a cue card, a cue card company when they had cue cards. There was, a, you know, Barney McNulty and a bunch of different cue card companies in New York and out here. And um, so I was literally in a studio. So I was holding cue cards for, you know, great people. And uh, so I felt like I was in, finally in the soundstage. And uh, while I was doing that, my, um, my brother had already started writing on a very popular show of the time called Hollywood Squares. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, he left to go on to bigger and better things. He got a movie or something. And uh, he's, so the job was open as the head writer there at that point. And uh, he said, well, my brother is just like me and he's funny and he writes. And so I submitted a bunch of, questions and jokes and and uh they hired me and uh so at 25 26 years old i was writing on a uh you know my first television show uh i was writing jokes and it was great yeah so that so right there i just started right away i was very young and very blessed to get in so quickly and then i just kind of moved my way right up the ladder so those were my first uh, my first big big breaks really. I was looking at the IMDb were the uh, Hollywood Squares as uh, the show that you were n nominated for Emmy uh, daytime Emmy award. Yeah, I had four four nominations, yeah. 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 yeah what it was, was that experience? <laughs> uh, it was great to be nominated. I did get the statue of that. So uh, my brother actually won the, uh, and that writing staff won the year before I got there. They actually did win the statue, and we, uh, I didn't, we didn't get it after that. But that was great to be nominated. Fantastic, very good, yeah. But I kind of got stuck in that, you know, kind of game show. Um, but I was also writing uh, some Vegas acts for some people, and you know, I was writing for some comedians, and then from then I just I, I wrote a spec script like everybody has to you know of a, of a sitcom and uh, and I got an agent and um, so then I moved on to uh, do some other things I stayed in variety for a bit you know writing variety shows um, and which was great because that was sketch writing you know because mm -hmm. all the variety shows had a singer you know you had a it was a singer, it was Sonny and Cher or Glenn Campbell or, you know, and then, but they do sketches. And, uh, of course, Carol Burnett was the biggest one at the time. Uh, but I, I kept doing uh, those shows for a while and then finally hit the sitcom world. So would you say that um, uh, from that, from the moment when you switched to the writing career, you were mostly focusing on writing in, in the early days? In the early days, that's all I thought. I could do. Yeah. I had mm -hmm. no, I mean, I, I, I really, all I wanted to do was write. I was just happy to be on staff on, on some great shows. And, um, you know, I, 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 I didn't even envision myself as producing or executive producing or all of that. You know, I just, I didn't even think anything about it. I didn't think, Oh yeah, one day I'm going to, I'm going to do that. It just happens that once you get in that, you know, slipstream, if you're good and you're talented, you move up and all those kind of titles are writing titles that come with it and more money until you learn to be a showrunner under great showrunners. You know, that's the only way you really learn to be a showrunner is to be there and 
learn from really people that are great at. Is there a, a sort of practice that you have or like a schedule routine for the writing that uh, you had uh, in, in the early days? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, uh, when you were on a show, it, you basically got in at 10 and sometimes got out by eight o'clock. Uh, and if the show was in trouble, you were there almost round the clock. You'd basically go home at midnight, one in the morning, sometimes two, get a few hours of sleep, turn around and drive back, you know. Uh, so, and especially, you know, when a show, a show just starts out and, you know, you're getting network notes and, you know, you're trying to stay on the air and the ratings aren't very good. And so that's a, that's a pretty grueling week uh, every week. But, um, yeah, I would just go by whatever the showrunner schedule was. And then when I became a showrunner, I would set the schedule for the writers. And uh, But, you know, if the show was working and it was clicking and it had been on the air for a while, it really runs like clockwork. You know the characters, you know the stories, you break all the stories, so you're, you get out at a decent time. That would say don't work for a showrunner who is not married. <laughs> you know, it was single you know they want to be there all day you know all night yeah you know, people with families want to get home <laughs> that's all right is there a, a particular story that you uh, want to share from working uh on the show from those days or or any days actually you know, i don't know i i you know there, I, it's such a great you know that and that's why i say i was lucky but i was also very blessed to do what i love and uh i it was it, they're all great you know all all the shows i i participated in or was on or ran uh i don't think there's any story that really stands out uh the job itself was just such fun you know being in a writer's room um it's fantastic you know that, that it's a breathing you know, it's alive in there with creativity and with ideas and uh, like minds, which is great. Uh, it just, uh, you just open the door and throw some meat in there, or food, and shut the door and <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep going. You know, I can't think of one offhand. Maybe as we go, I might, I might remember something that would be interesting. Uh, but it was, it's just working with great people, you know, working with uh, Stephen Bochco and, uh, in my career and, and working with John Ritter, who was a very good friend of mine, being on Hooperman, which was a great show. We were, that was a show that was, um, at the time, it, a lot of people were doing dramedies and nobody even knew what they were. You know, it was Slap Maxwell and uh, Frank's Place and Days and Nights of Molly Dodd and Wonder Years and... Um, you know, Hooperman and then Doogie, of course, uh, they were great. You know, they couldn't even categorize them back then. They, they weren't sure how to give them nominations or anything. And uh, But I think that experience for me uh, was just fun. Going, I, I loved going to work every day because John was a good friend. My brother was the executive producer on the show. I was working with Stephen Bochco. Uh, great actors on that show, so uh, it's not a you know fantastic uh, fun story, but it's just I think to me that was the one of the best times I ever had as a writer. Hooperman show um, that you mentioned is uh, you have credits. Uh, I saw that you have a written credit, written by, and teleplay. Uh, what's the difference between those? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think sometimes uh, if 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 somebody does the story, somebody else does the story, and you do the actual teleplay is what the difference is. Uh, mm. But if you if it's written by you did the story and the and the script, so teleplay is basically uh, I did the script and somebody else came up with the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Dougie uh, Hauser, MD. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, Starring Neil Patrick Harris, right? Yep. Yeah. Where uh, did you get a chance to communicate? 
uh, with him. Or you know, we, I didn't <laughs> communicate too much with Neil. I uh, unless it was my particular episode, you know, where mm-hmm. I'd go down to the set and. Uh, um, mm-hmm. Neil was 16 when we did shoot it, and Doogie was 16, so it was it was great. Uh, Vinny um, uh, was actually 21 playing 16, which uh, uh, Max Casella, we, who was great, who's gone on to do wonderful things, you know, uh, uh, The Sopranos and you know a bunch of bunch of great shows. Uh, but Neil was was terrific. I mean, he was he, he was just perfect. And as I remember, uh, the network wasn't crazy about it. You know, after the pilot, they 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 were like, you know, we're not sure about this. You know, and it was like, what do you mean you're not sure? This is a great idea. You know, and we dealt with such great topics and and interesting. You know, we had it was a great again. It was that dramedy where you could do stuff that touched people or moved people and had heart and you could also do big funny inside that world but it came out very organically you know it wasn't a laugh track it wasn't any of that so uh and neil was terrific he, at that age he was he was a great actor back then and continues to be so uh it was uh, it was it was fun it was really a lot of fun and it went on for four years, so you know it was like the network was kind of wrong on that one. Uh, and we were on Wednesday nights, and uh, Seinfeld was against us on Wednesdays, mm. and and we were beating Seinfeld pretty handily in the ratings. And then they moved Seinfeld to Thursday nights, put it in that kind of, you know, again that little. Uh, you know, great slot behind uh, uh, the Cosby Show or whatever it was, and uh, and then it became a hit. You know, and then it was huge. So, for the state on Wednesdays, maybe uh, wouldn't have been as uh, big. And you have the credits of the writer and the producer and a senior producer uh, on the that show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're all just glorified names for writers. You know, until you hit that the executive producer or co-exec, you know, at the co-exec level, you have, you can run the table while the exec is off, you know, editing or whatever, but all the other ones are just, you know, title and money. You know, it's not, you, you don't get more. I mean, you get say, you get more of a say on an episode that you yourself wrote, uh, but yeah, just titles. Mm. But they move you right up the ladder that way. Would you say that this uh, genre of dramedy was sort of like a frontier work? Nobody had done that before? Yes, it was. And then it kind of went away for a while, you know, because it was, the sitcoms were very you know, much multi, uh, multi-camera, you know, big laugh tracks and, and, uh, and all that. So it kind of bumped up against all that and people were like, yeah, we don't know what this is all about. And it, I guess it was the frontier, really, of that. And then, you know, now that's all there is. I mean, not all there is. There's, you know, the CBS shows and stuff like that. But uh, now everybody is doing that kind of thing with a half hour. You know, you're dealing with different subjects that are that you wouldn't have dealt with in, in you know, those multi-camera shows. And even those early single camera shows but once everybody went to single camera it became very precious you know the dramedy was very precious you know uh and some of them weren't that funny <laughs> but you also have the director credit right on the yeah the- I, I got to do yes on, on wins you know that that was uh started my directing stuff which was great you know uh i loved it because it was so much easier than 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 coming into a blank uh uh, computer screen, you know, and fade in, you know. Now what do you do? Uh, so as a director, you have the script and you have the actors and you can push them around and uh, say, go over there and do all this, but you have the words. And I know directors will argue with me about it, but, it, it, you know, it, facing a blank page is, is definitely harder than, than uh, having it and having a good script and, a, and good actors to work with, uh, which was great. And the wins were terrific. You know, they were absolutely, absolutely great. I mean, I was working with a very creative family and um, they were all very generous and um, 
you know, I came on to that show a little later. They had already been on for 13 weeks um, and they had gone through uh, quite a few executive producers in those 13 weeks. And when I came on, um, it was, uh, I, we had, a, I, I don't know, they had met with a few people and I guess I, I won <laughs> or whatever, not won, but they liked me the, they liked me the best, I guess, out of all those meetings. And, you know, I said, I, I told them, I said, you know, we got to tell some better stories here. That's all, you know, this is kind of a sketch show. And then it, they were doing great, but I think it was, it was still kind of big. Uh, and then hopefully I brought that to it a little bit more, more storytelling. And, and we went to a hundred episodes. So I saw that you have uh, three credits as a writer on the Wayans brothers and then 66 credits as the uh, executive producer yeah. or so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, but you said that it's some somewhat similar the the job, uh, or or not? Well, no. I mean, the, the, I always wrote the, or we always wrote the the first episode of every season, you know, to get everybody started and on the same page. But um, yeah, I, I, my writing credit was the same that I would always have, or anybody would have as as writing the script, but. Um, uh, I was running the show, so I had, I couldn't really do a script all the time, you know. Uh, and I was running it with my partner at the time, Tom Moore, who was a great writer and very funny man. Um, and so we would split things up, and you know, he would run the room, or I would go down the stage, and you know, because I, you know, on a, on a show like that, you're writing the new show that's going to come up. And you're working on this week's show while you're writing next week's show, and you're editing last week's show. So, as an executive producer, showrunner, you you wear a lot of hats. You have to go. You're, you're being pulled out of the writers' room a lot because you have to go down to the stage. You have to answer networks, you know, stuff. You have to oversee casting. You you're editing. You're sweetening shows. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's you know I would love to have written all the episodes, <laughs> uh, and, and but yeah, that's that's kind of the nature of the of the business with that. Would you say uh, all the episodes or most of the episodes on the Wayans Brothers are uh, fully scripted, or there is some room for the improv? Well, they they like they that? they improved, you know wherever they could, you know, but I, I always asked them to give me everything that was in the script first, you know, and then let's play, you know, then let's, and they were very good at it. And they were very uh, respectful of me as I was of them because they were so, they were so great. They, they knew, they knew what they were doing when they, when they got off script, which, you know, some people don't. And that's the, that's the worst thing about improving a lot, you know. It's some a lot of the times you, it just comes out like, oh, you know, let's focus, let's get back to the script. But I think once you have that script uh, and it's tight and it's been through a lot of rewrites, uh, so it's shootable, um, then you can play a little bit in certain scenes. Yeah, it was great because you could run down to the set and give them a new joke, you know. Uh, um, or they would come up with the, you know, a couple of other jokes that were better than the ones we had written. So yeah, it's, it's great. And they work so well together. So you'd say uh, you were writing in one room and then they are performing in the other room <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> well, you know, they're down at the, it's usually they're down on the stage during mm -hmm. the week and rehearsing and then you're up, but and on the night of taping, you know, me as a director or even executive producer without even directing the show, uh, you're in a booth and they're down on the stage with the audience. So, uh, so you can run down there, you know, you, it's almost physically, you have to kind of go down there and huddle and say, here, here's a better joke. Uh, and the audience gets to see, you know, two versions of the same scene sometimes. Yeah. So you need endurance for this. <laughs> yes. You need endurance. As a, you need endurance for that. And also just as a career, you know, you have to endure a lot of, you know, knockdowns and picking yourself back up. Yeah. Was there a, a moment that you like to share of uh, the knockdowns and things that that puts you off for some time? Or yeah, I uh, I think it's like 
you know, for me, it's like sometimes I didn't listen to my own instincts, you know, on some pilots that I had done uh, that I would go back and rethink and, and listen to my own instincts, you know, because you do get a lot of notes, but you have to fight for the ones you, you truly believe in. I think I don't have, you know, too many regrets, but I look back at some of the things and say, you know, I, I got to a place where I felt my writing was, I was confident. And that takes a while as a writer to, to get to confidence. The more writing you do, the more confidence you get, you know, uh, and you have to build that confidence as a writer to know when your stuff works, you know, and know because you know a lot of times you're you let other things get in the way of that and the only thing that that that, that gives you that confidence is um is writing you know and learning from yourself learning from others of, uh, of course so the writings get get better i think stephen Boschko taught me a lot my and my brother taught me a lot you know he was ahead of me as a writer and you know became an executive producer before i did and all that and and he's a great writer and you know he was kind of my mentor he was like you're my big brother which was great to have him and also steven bochko who who taught me a lot about story you know and and how to how to wire a story and how to make sure you you get that story working so perfectly that it's you know bulletproof before you start writing fade in before you start mm. writing the script in a nutshell uh, what 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 is the process looks like to like come up with the story, uh, the main steps that you need to hit or something like that? It's always the, the three act, you know, structure to me. It's, you know, no matter what it is. I mean, it's a screenplay, a, even a, you know, six act drama, you always think in three acts, you know, what is that beginning, middle and end of it? And if you can get those tent poles, you know, those, those kind of big moments, that, that gets you through a script and then start connecting those dots. You know, once you've got those big beats, you got to know where your story ends. You got to know where that middle is and you got to know how, how that inciting incident and in TV, the inciting incident starts right away, you know, wait. Um, and getting that, you know, that story up on its feet, not, not waiting for things to happen just to be, you know, there's an immediacy in television. And then, you know, working the scenes within that, you know, what scene is going to get me to, to the middle? What scene is going to get me to the end? And what are those big moments for the twists and turns? If you can get those big beats in there, and that's why I think writing a beat sheet and writing a full outline before you even start your script is... and, and three drafts of everything, you know, work it until, because every time you rewrite a beat sheet, every time you rewrite an outline, you start going deeper into the story. You start understanding it better and you start how to, you start figuring out how to improve those moments and you go deeper and deeper into story. And once you have that story that's so tight, uh, then you can start writing the script because you have a full outline. It's madness to try to change story when you're in script so to me getting the idea working out the characters working out the story engine working out the beats of a story working out the outline and then the rewrite those to me are the two hardest parts the script is the easiest once you have all that work done the script is the easiest then the rewrite is the second second piece that's the hardest script should be the, the fun part the easy part would you say you uh, done it uh, without um, some sort of testing uh, with the audience or with other people who uh, read your work give you notes uh, where just uh, can you describe the process of sort of how do you how do you know that the script is good yeah I think you have to well I think I was talking about instinct before and I'm trusting that and then I, I really couldn't trust that until I had worked for a while, you know. I mean, I was always a good writer, but I always got better and better just by doing that. And I think no, I think getting notes from people that can give you good notes, you know, that you that understand story and understand structure, uh, 
because notes can be very subjective, you know, and and certain notes can throw you way off. And sometimes uh, going down those paths is more interesting because it's you've worked at it too long. But I think there's a point where you have to be, you have to tell yourself it's good, you know. Um, and once you've gotten notes, from, like I say, people you trust that can give you good notes. Uh, and once you start understanding by writing more, what is a good note and what is not a good note? You know, what's going to make this script better? Um, and, you know, it never it, scripts are never perfect. You know, I, I don't think I've ever seen a perfect script in my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've seen stuff on the air that I've shot that I, you know, yeah, really? Do we shoot that? Uh, I, I'm never satisfied. But at one, some point, you have to say, this is done, and this is good, and I'm confident in it. You know, you can certainly pick things apart. But yeah, I think it's an instinct that you learn by writing, you know, and you learn more and more by writing every day and, you know, continuing to write and learning from your own writing. Writing, you, the more and more you write, the better you get, and, you know, after a while, you're not a rookie anymore. You know, you're, you're doing it. What was your first uh, writing machine or instrument? <laughs> oh, it was a, well, I, I think when I was at a show, uh, I mean, certainly when I was, when I was playing around with it way back uh, was a, was, you know, I, I, don't, I can't show it. It's such a big, heavy typewriter. But I have an old, old typewriter there, which is just for looks. But it's great. But that's, that's what it was. And, but it was an electric portable, you know, a little electric portable typewriter. And then selectrates. And then we got into the, to the computers. The K-Pro computer, I think, was the first one that we all wrote on. But, yeah. But, yeah, it was the, a typewriter just like that old one. Yeah. It's, it's not just allows you to write, but also gives you a workout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're just pushing down those keys. But select rates were great. And I'm still not a good typer. I'm fast, but uh, I still don't you know, use all my fingers. But I'm pretty quick. I've learned my, my own technique. Do you have like a number, like 80 words per minute or something? <laughs> oh, but it's much slower than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for a long time, I wrote everything out longhand because I felt like doing that was a good way to do a first draft. And then I would, you know, put it into the computer. And so I felt like that was my first rewrite. But I, yeah, I don't do that anymore. That's too much, too much. First draft by hand, I think it's yeah, long hand is a really good yeah. experience because you, you you don't have to like self edit, you just kinda keep writing. Right. It slows you down and, and to me it's it's a great way to do it because I, I, I believe you you should not uh, uh, I think you should vomit out a first draft. You should just get it out. Get pages, get computer, uh, you know, then but again the confidence you get is when you have done three drafts of a great outline, a really terrific, you know, solid outline with dialogue in it, with, with you know, with big paragraphs in it instead of just, you know, small, just going deep, deep into that story. Then that confidence gives you the ability to just plow through a script because if you start going back and you write a scene and then you go back and rewrite it, you know, you're slowing your process down. Do you have uh, certain rituals uh, to reward yourself when you complete work, when you finish script oh, or finish yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yes, I like to put them away and just celebrate because it, it, writing any script is a big accomplishment. I don't care if it's a, you know, twelve-page, you know, kind of streaming you know, small thing or a full screenplay, you know, anywhere in between, that is an accomplishment and you should, you know, enjoy that and revel in it for a while and put it away. Because when you get back to it, 
you'll see all the mistakes. <laughs> you'll see all those flaws. But yeah, I, I like to celebrate. I'll have a you know glass of vodka or something and uh, and play golf and you know hang out. Yeah, it does. It feels good. It does feel good. By the way, how how does your personal life that you do that you live outside of you, the writer's room and things af affect the, the things that you work on? Always, uh, everything I do, I think affects everything I write. Uh, and you know, the experience, you know, the more experience you have in life, the more knowledge you have. Uh, you know, I still read books. Uh, I still have magazines, uh, you know, I, we have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, when computers, you know, TV on all the time. I, I, you know, I'm always absorbing, you know, life and putting it on the page in one form or another. Even if, you know, the, you know, you always put something of yourself in a script. Uh, even if you're writing something that's totally different, you know, animation or superhero or whatever, you're always, you've got to put yourself in there because that's, that's the soul that makes the writing stand out. You know, it makes your voice, it's your voice. You know, that's, that's what's going to set you apart. That's why pilots are so important now, you know, spec pilots. It used to be that all you wrote was a spec script of an existing show, but uh, spec pilots are all that's that it's all you and that's what stands out to executives and networks and things like that that unique voice that they're always looking for and that's what's going on right now you know I think it's 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 you know there's so much product out there that needs content and needs uh, writers so I think it's easier to to kind of get these pilots out there uh, than it is to get on staff on a show. Because if, if it's good and it has heat on it and somebody's pushing it around and, uh, you know, the, the, there's so many marketplaces for, for writers now. So opportunity abounds. You know, the... Money may be less in the little places, but who cares? It's still TV money. It's still good. <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes I feel like, uh, well, right now these days can happen is to have a, a paralysis by analysis. Like there's so many options that, yeah. <laughs> and it's everywhere true. you need to either pay something or or fill out the like a two day worth of um, application form. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, TV is so good right now, which is great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, uh, it's just I can't watch everything that I want to watch. And I have lists of things that people have recommended, you know, but, uh, you know, I find myself going back to the, to the ones I love, like uh, Peaky Blinders just, you know, came back with season six and I just binge watched it yesterday. Uh, and I mean, I love that show. So, you know, I stick to kind of the, the ones that always make me excited about writing and excited about TV. Would you say the shows that you like to watch yourself uh, are different in like genres or the way they approach the story than the things that you interested in writing? Yeah, I mean, you know, my career was, you know, started out in comedy and kind of stayed there for a long time and then i kind of switched over a little bit to drama and i did some drama work and i i, I like that also and i and i feel that that's easier for me too because it's not you know you don't have to make it funny you know you you, you so uh i i tend to watch more drama now i do i tend to watch more drama um just because i love the way they're telling stories nowadays, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I'm not impressed with a lot of the comedies that are around right now. Um, you know, some of them aren't even making me laugh and they, they're labeled comedies. I go, well, that sounds like it should be funny, but somehow it isn't. <laughs> uh, and I watch a lot of British shows. I love their detective shows and their comedies, you know, they're, you know, some of them are pretty big and broad, but, um, 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I like everything. I, I, I really enjoy it. I've written in kind of everything, you know, uh, sci-fi, and I've written animation, and I've written um, all sorts of different things. So, you know, I've kind of, you know, became that I could go in a lot of different directions, but it took me a long time to get there. Is there a particular uh, screenplay uh, or teleplay that you wrote uh, that you proud of the most I'd say <laughs> I think the stuff I'm doing now you know I'm kind of developing stuff right now and uh, I think those are the ones that I'm really proud of I did a drama a long time ago you know way before I did a lot of the half hour comedies that I did which was a, um, a historical piece uh, it was a civil rights case and uh, I was moving uh, my ex-wife up to I was moving her parents out of their house and this book kind of fell open to this page and I thought wow this is interesting and I started reading this article and so I based it on that and um, it, it's you know I think that I was very proud of that for, for a long time and I did sell it but it never got done um, but uh, you know I got the money for it but I didn't uh, it never saw a camera so I'm looking at it again I'm kind of dusting it off and thinking maybe I'll take a look at that again. But I love a lot of the stuff I'm doing right now. So, you know, that's, and I guess that's the way it should be. You should love the stuff you're doing right now, you know. Yeah. Is it more TV related or feature yeah. films? Yeah, it's, I, I am, uh, I did pitch a feature uh, uh, a little bit ago and I'm waiting to see what happens with that. So I'm moving, yeah, more towards, uh, more towards film now. Even in the the TV I'm writing, you know, more towards the uh, limited series and you know small, smaller but you know bigger concept shows. Do you watch feature films? Uh, I do watch feature films. Yeah, I love fe you know I love feature films and uh, you know the the difference with film is that film is plot driven, of course. And you still have to develop great characters, but the characters are dealing with the plot more than anything else. Where TV is dealing with characters, you know, they are, they are. Uh, it's all about. That's the only reason you really come back. You want to see what these great characters are doing every week. You know, if you take Sopranos, Peaky Blinders, you know, uh, Breaking Bad, Modern Family, uh, you know, any shows, you, you love those characters. You, you want to. You, you, want to come back and see the characters you you love or hate or love to hate or you know what are they doing this week and how are they getting through their lives um that's what sells television shows to me is characters so uh but film you know is you're really dealing with that plot and how these characters get from make it through to the end where tv make it through to at least the first season, hopefully the other seasons, they have bigger arcs, you know, that you can deal with, which is much more fun. So would you say if you, you want as a writer, as a creator, you want to have your work seen, uh, uh, the best path would be uh, to make it to the TV, uh, uh, then the feature films, especially lower budget projects. Yes, I think so. Uh, lower budgets and also uh, the immediacy, you know, it's, 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 it's quicker. Uh, it takes so long to get a movie sold and after that to get it even made and then to even get it shot. It's just such a long process. Uh, could, you know, it gets maddening. You know. My son is you know, doing, uh, he does both TV and, and movies and uh, he just sold a, a, a movie to Sony, which is great. Uh, with his cousin, my brother's son. So it's in the family, nicely tucked into the family. But he's done some features that have, you know, have gotten made, but again, it takes a long time. It's a long process. So would you say if you were on a, a desert island uh, and there's two options to take with you, um, either TV shows or feature films, <laughs> which one uh, would you take? Yeah, uh, I think if you'd ask me this question, Probably uh, ten years ago, I would have said television. <laughs> now I think it's uh, 
I, I like the slower process of the of the feature film. And now yeah. you know you you don't even have to go to the movie theater anymore. You know you go for the big blockbusters or the big action films, uh, and you still love that experience with an audience around you enjoying a horror movie or the big blockbuster action films. But now we've all got big screen TVs. You can get eighty six. <laughs> you know you can get fifty. And we've got surround sound, and we've got great stuff, and it's more intimate, you know. So I think we will always go to a movie theater for that experience of that group experience. But I think it's getting less and less. Uh, you know, I think the more character, quieter stuff is is. You know, I, I still love the independent movie. You know, still love that. Would you say now um, it, it is uh, a different experience uh, of watching TV shows with your family um, than it was when you were a kid and first discover the television? Yes, it's it's you know I mean it's like we 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 tend to my wife and I tend to sit around and go oh okay so we've got time for this one Endeavor just came on. You know the new endeavor. We got to watch that at eight o'clock. You know, let's get dinner. We'll bring it in. We'll watch it. it, it yeah, it's it really is a, a a full thing. And then just you know, saying, well, I'm going to get through Ozark tonight. You know, and by two o'clock in the morning, you're kind of oh gosh, I must have missed two episodes there. So yeah, the experience is a little more uh, not as exciting as it was. But like with you know shows like Peaky Blinders that I've been waiting to come back for quite a few years, that excitement was was great to see that show again. So that that ability I think is nice that you know they take their time between. So you're really anticipating stuff, like uh, you know Bosch or Ozark. You've been away from it for so long. That excitement that you is is there, which is terrific, terrific. But I'm still watching old movies, you know. I'm still watching, you know, TCM and loving the old, uh, you know, uh, Thin Man series. I can watch those over and over again. I can watch The Godfather anytime it's on television, even if I just saw it yesterday. <laughs> uh, you know, television. The one thing about television is, you know, we're everybody who's creating television, whether you're the craft service guy or the executive producer you you're really creating something great and television changes people all the time you know where a movie or a good novel you know you'll be moved you'll be changed but we can change people every day it's it's really powerful you know it's the one of the most powerful things around where you, when you I mean news and everything I mean every day You're, you're changing people's lives with television. So it's exciting. Still, I'm still excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of changing lives, uh, imagine that you were an extraterrestrial from another world that is perfect <laughs> and everything is organized in it and uh, everyone lives in harmony. And now you see our world with uh, all its beauties and <laughs> imperfections. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what would be the one thing that uh, you'd fix? Wow, I think, I think the way the world is right now, it's just it's so nuts to me. I mean, look at we're dealing with a war, and we're dealing with politics and a pandemic, and a, I think I would, you know, I'm still such an optimist about life and. And everything uh, I would hope that we would all take something from this time this past three years you know take something from it and really take some stock in what's going on uh, the division in America and you know you're looking back at stuff and you're going Jesus have we changed that much where and where are we going so I I think I would say you know I would ask them to help me look into the future so I could I could make we could come out of this better you know and I hope as writers and as creators 
that we take stock in all this. And like I say, it is such a powerful um, medium that, and the, that we, we've got to use it. You know, we've got to use it better than having news as entertainment. You know, we have to use, we have to create news as just news and facts and, and change this planet that we are losing, you know, every day. So I think I would ask them, yeah, help me out here. You know, you with the one eye, come over here. <laughs> help me look into the future and tell me what I should be doing as a writer or as a person to save our planet and our, yeah, I better stop there. Or I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to get on a soapbox here and be uh, Aaron Sorkin. And the last question for the, for today. Um, is there something uh, that you are um, currently obsessed with in a positive way uh, that you do the most of, most of the time? Painting. I've always been a good, good artist and I, I, you know, I'm painting, you know, painting to me was, was like a drug. I could get so relaxed doing it. So I'm getting very obsessed about my work and I, uh, I want my paintings to get out there. You know, I've never thought about, you know, that before. And I think now at this point in my life, I'm obsessed with that just trying to paint more and express myself through a different art form, then, you know, my creative brain has always been that side that this work. So I'm going to give that more fuel by getting more obsessed with my uh, doing more canvases. Well, let us know when you have your art exhibition as well. <laughs> I, would, I would love that. And uh, hopefully it'll be soon. Hopefully it'll be soon. I've got a lot of good stuff that I'm proud of right now. Thank you, Phil. Uh, what is the best way to find you online uh, if someone uh, wants to know more about your, your work? Uh, you know, I don't really have a website out there now, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm going to get out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably put one out with uh, my my um, for my art. So that'll come soon. I guess the other way is just Google me and uh, figured out. And I guess the other way to, to really contact me is through UCLA because I am still teaching there, having a wonderful time with my students and I've had great success with a lot of them through the writer's program there. Um, it's a very good program. I, yeah, you know. Yeah, that was great. That's that's how I learned about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And your gr uh, greatness and the humor and the, each class was amazing. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really having a great time still doing that. It's uh, it's been a great opportunity for me because uh, it was a great way to give back by teaching. And I've come, so many students have come through my classes now that I feel that I've I've given back. Well, Phil, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Sure, thank you, Constantine. This is great. This is great fun. It's, it's great just to remember some stuff. You know, <laughs> I haven't looked back on a few things uh, in quite a while, so it's nice to just uh, take a look at it from a different angle. <laughs>